Thank you. Um, it's lovely to be here in um, this wonderful country. It's um, been, been great so far and lovely to, to meet people, everyone today. So I'm just going to say a few short words about Rosie um, for those of you who aren't familiar with her work and then we will play her lecture. There'll be time for about 30 to 40 minutes of questions, I think, afterwards. So do be thinking of the things you want to ask her when she joins us um, live later on. So Professor Rosie Bredotti is a contemporary continental philosopher and feminist theorist. She's currently Professor Emeritus at Utrecht University, where she's taught since 1988. She was the founding professor of women's studies at Utrecht University, founding director of the Netherlands School of Women's Studies, and founder director of the Centre um, for the Humanities there as well. Her main publications include Nomadic Subjects, Nomadic Theory, and The Posthuman, which may be the, the volume that you're most familiar with, and Posthuman Knowledge. She also co edited Conflicting Humanities with Paul Gilroy and the Posthuman Glossary a new edition um, of which is coming out very soon. Throughout her work, Rosie Bredotti asserts and demonstrates the importance of combining theoretical concerns with a serious commitment to producing socially and politically relevant scholarship that contributes to making a difference um, in the world. That's enough from me, so I will hand over and we'll play the video. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Dear friends and colleagues of the International Conference by the significant title, Why Steal Education? Um, and dear friends at the University of Belgrade, Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory, where I have many good friends and colleagues. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this important proceeding. And uh, forgive me for being present only virtually. Um, I've never even been to Belgrade, let alone had the pleasure of meeting you all but um, I am forced to stay put for the time being. Um, so I hope that you will accept my humble virtual offer um, as a contribution to the work of this important conference. I've decided to address the educational perspective of humanism, posthumanism, anti-humanism through um, a simple, I hope, uh, although complex in its own way, presentation of the key concept in posthuman critical theory. Um, and my pedagogical aim in, in this lecture is to really put down my cards on the table and um, enable you to see step by step how a qualitatively different way of thinking can be set up starting from posthuman premises. Um, each building block key concept uh, functioning like a modular unit that can, you can move around and shift to your own ends and purposes, creating your own cartographies, roadmaps, and eventually projects. Um, structures are what education is all about, and they are the qualitative element in posthuman education, which would otherwise simply be a quantitative increase or accumulation of knowledge. So my, my message really is quite simple, that posthuman thought is not just about adding non-human elements to your practice, research, and pedagogy. Uh, qualitative shifts are needed. And what these qualitative shifts are, I think, is the key forum for the discussion. And this is what I will go on to elucidate in the rest of the talk. So two starting assumptions, and I should say that it took me a very long time to kind of narrow down my concern about the posthuman condition to these building blocks. I ended up writing a trilogy on the subject, which is more than I would ever have imagined. Uh, the posthuman 2013, posthuman knowledge 2019, posthuman feminism 2022. Uh, and they all start from the basic uh, assumption <clears throat> that the posthuman is a convergence that is already upon us. It is not a future condition that we're leading towards. It is right here and now, um, caught between the fourth industrial revolution and the sixth extinction, I'll return to this, caught between the need to critique humanism, but an equally strong need to critique anthropocentrism. Uh, 
So that's the first assumption, a posthuman convergence that historically is already here. Second assumption, when we say posthuman, let's focus on the basic idea, basic but still not accepted globally, that the human never was a neutral term to begin with. Uh, human is a term that indexes access to specific entitlements, powers, faculty, norms, and privileges that come with rights and visibility. We are not all human in the same way or to the same extent. There are hierarchies of human, non-human, inhuman, um, dehumanized that we need to take into account. So crucial, the, um, the, the need to look at the two-pronged critique, critique of humanism, critique of anthropocentrism. And critique of humanism is in a sense more uh, recognizable because critical theory in feminism, race theory, indigenous post-colonial theory has been doing that for decades. But the notion that the Western humanist idea of man far from being the universal measure of all things, is actually a very specific, a culture-specific, Eurocentric notion of hierarchies that position masculinity, whiteness, uh, Europeanness, and at the pinnacle of human evolution. And this man that has um, uh, pretty much uh, monopolized the powers of thinking, the powers of reason, Jenny Loy calls him the man of reason, this enlightenment vision of the human subject uh, defines himself by what he excludes. And what he excludes are the others, uh, and I have defined them in my work as the sexualized, racialized, naturalized others, women LBGT, uh, black, indigenous, non-Westerners non in general, and all the non-human animals, earth, um, the non-anthropomorphic entities. Um, so the critique of humanism is a critique of a certain set of power relations built into a vision of the human, whereas the critique of anthropocentrism is the critique of species hierarchies, the notion that across cultures and across history, across space and time, the anthropomorphic being, the human, has positioned themselves as the kings of creation, the pinnacle of all that lives, and that species hierarchies is, of course, called into question in the context of one of the events of the posthuman convergence, the sixth extinction, climate change, the crisis of the environment, the Anthropocene, whichever term you use to indicate the, face, the fact that our planet is simply suffering and cracking under the strain of sustaining the model of economic growth, of economic development that we have adopted um, since Western modernity became the template. So critique of humanism, critique of anthropocentrism, they can run parallel, but they are not the same thing. And my um, example for this is always think of so much of critical theory, race, feminist critiques of humanism that do not take into account the environment, animals, the earth, and vice versa. Think of animal rights, Anna Peter Singer, Martha Nussbaum, very valuable, um, very intelligent people who, however, reassert humanism while uh, um, uh, extending human rights to the non-humans. So the way in which you mix critique of humanism, post-humanism, and critique of anthropocentrism, post-anthropocentrism, the way you mix and match can be very varied. The crucial thing about the, the post-human convergence is that you need to keep both um, branches of thinking um, uh, e equally balanced in your critical mind. It is not as if we have advanced robotics and advanced technologies on Monday and climate crisis on Wednesday afternoon. Those things are happening concurrently at the same time. Um, sixth extinction, fourth industrial revolution, two totally opposite trends. You know that I am a great um, disciple of Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, who defined advanced capitalism as a schizophrenic system. Um, fourth industrial revolution, AI, incredible developments, and on the other hand, the, the sixth extinction with the, the environment cracking under the strain 
of um, this absolutely unsustainable um, model of development. Built into this idea of the convergence and the, the need to keep the complexity of environmentalism, digital revolution, climate crisis, and advanced technologies in balance, built into this is the critical posthumanist critique of transhumanism. Transhumanism being the official ethos of advanced capitalism, uh, a blind act of trust into the redeeming power of technologies, technologies as an instrument of human enhancement, human perfectibility, and transhumanism is preached by the likes of uh, Nick Bostrom in Oxford, a brilliant scholar who presents the transhumanist project of redefining the human through technology as the accomplishment of the enlightenment project of perfecting humanity through science and technologies, the triumph of humanistic reason. So transhumanism is also the ethos of Silicon Valley. Transhumanism is the ethos of Elon Musk, the wealthiest man on earth, who not only has done um, electrical um, uh, uh, cars, um, it also has invested in neural in enhancement, and of course, is the man of space exploration and the colonization of Mars. Um, the idea um, that the transhumanists um, defend is that the human in its old format is a slower neurological apparatus than the uh, computational systems that we have created, and consequently, the human needs to be enhanced through technology. Um, but in, in the same breath, um, uh, Nick Bostrom says nothing about the environment, but Elon Musk is very eloquent about the environment when he says that planet Earth is over. It is depleted. There's nothing of interest here for somebody who needs cobalt to make lithium for the batteries of his electric cars. It's very difficult to mine cobalt uh, on Earth. So what is the solution? Well, we're going to get these minerals from outer space. And the exploration of space, the commercialization of space, extractive economies on other planets is the push behind the current space race, the new exploration of space. And you will not be surprised to know that 80% of NASA business is privatized and it is people like Musk, but also Jeff Bezos of Amazon that are actually funding the new moon station that will be open by 2026 as the relay for the new missions that go to Mars, Mars being very rich in minerals. So transhumanism is a very coherent philosophy totally uh, supportive of advanced capitalism, using technology to improve the old model of the human, and also using technology to continue extraction economies in other planets. There is, in transhumanism, not a moment of environmental ecological awareness, not a moment of criticism of the cruelty and the ruthlessness of the neoliberal economics behind the enhancement project and a total lack of care for the planet and its inhabitants, human and unhuman. Critical posthumanism is a very passionate and very rigorous response to this ideology. Um, it is a practical philosophy of affirmation and care. It is a political philosophy that calls the bluff of cognitive capitalism, and it is also a philosophy of social justice, reminding us that human enhancement projects fail to define what it is that the human um, would be in the first place, who is going to be enhanced by what, by whom, according to which criteria. Huge discussion here, but critical posthumanism makes a very clear intervention in this debate. The philosophy that undermines this project is neomaterialism. And here is a very major building block. Neomaterialist philosophies reread with contemporary rendition of Spinoza, in my case, Deleuze and Guattari on radical immanence, um, a very simple idea, totally compatible with contemporary uh, physics. We are all made of the same elementary particles. We are all variations on the same matter. All that lives is a nature-culture continuum in constant transformation, self-organizing, uh, intelligent matter that aims to 
perpetuate in being. It is, there is an ontological drive in all that lives to persevere in its existence. Life lives. And this fundamental Spinoza's message is post-personal, pre-personal. It's, it's not about individual immortality, people of the cryonics brigade. It is about this endlessly generative powers of all that lives to continue producing life in multiplicity of forms. So in, in uh, the, I guess the modern text for this that I would recommend is Felix Guattari, The Three Ecologies, where he gives you the ecologies of the environment, social ecology, and then personal, psychic, emotional ecology. And shot throughout all of this, the idea of technology. I wanted to remind you that Spinoza himself was a technician. He, he, he made lens and optical instruments for a living. He was not a professional philosopher. Today, he would have been a programmer and some sort of nerd for sure. Uh, the notion of technology is built into uh, this. Techno technological artifacts are as alive as living organic organism today. That's the greatness of our system. And never confuse critical posthumanism as an anti-technology position. It is not. We love our technologies, but we want to be able to have democratic discussions about the uses and abuses, the applications, and the availability of this incredible moment of progress that is made possible by contemporary technologies. So neo-materialism, you will find it throughout. There are variations on it, uh, but very much uh, a, a crucial building block. Next building block, very important, and in some way uh, simple, but proved controversial, my emphasis on subjectivity. Critical posthuman theory requires a theory of the subject. Um, and this breaks from mainstream posthuman positions, Latour, the object in ontologists, uh, various forms of science and technology studies that liquidate uh, the subject, saying we have networks, we have systems, we have algorithmic processes, what do we need the old-fashioned subject for? Well, I, since the early days of my nomadism work, I have been arguing till I'm blue in the face that we absolutely need a theory and practice of subjectivity in order to uphold an ethics of affirmation and care and a politics of solidarity and social justice. Without subjectivity, all of these issues disappear. And you see this in the transhumanist project where there is no mention of social justice, of solidarity, of human rights. It's all abstractions, disembedded and disembodied. My subject is embedded, embodied, relational, and effective. Um, it is de-linked from the enlightenment notion of a universalist transcendental reason, but it is very strongly embedded in practices of thinking as relational, collaborative alliances and assemblages with other humans and a multiplicity of non-humans. We couldn't think without a roof over our heads, without microphones, screens, books, vitamins, um, uh, good life, um, good loving, uh, and a minimum of sustainability. So you never think alone, and you never think inside a black box of, of neural um, uh, systems. Uh, thinking is the stuff of the world, as Stacey Alemo put it so eloquently. So a neo-materialist philosophy of immanence supports a notion of the subject as heterogeneous, an assemblage that includes relations to non-humans, be organic non-humans or technological non-humans. And it is what I refer to as Zoe geo techno subjects. Um, the, the subjects that are non-human, zoe, animal, planet, and they're grounded geologically, and they're technologically mediated. Uh, so the zoe geo techno is an assemblage, they're templates, um, but my emphasis as always is on the interconnection of these terms. Um, we are not only Zoe and not techno. We are not only techno and not geo. There's not only the environment or only technology. These things have to be crossed over. Technology needs to be grounded and the environment needs to be technologized. This crossover is the great posthuman challenge and it's a very exciting horizon that defines our era. So, so basically to say the posthuman subject includes 
a relationship to non-human is both a banality and blasphemy, because how does that work exactly? It's one thing to recognize our interdependence on a multiplicity of non-human others. Quite another to be able to theorize, to explain, to teach how this interconnection affects our self-understanding and our process of becoming human subjects. The diversity of life as Zoe geotechno mediations is not a way of flattening out all differences. And here, posthuman critical theory breaks completely from object-oriented ontology and any notion of flat ontology. There's nothing flat about a neo-materialist philosophy of life. It's differential. It is made of continuous processes of differentiation, mutations, variations on the same matter. The difference is that these processes of differentiation are not hierarchical. They are not indexed on a normative model of the human as the enlightenment man of reason, the, the capitalist colonialist uh, conquering male that brings civilization to the barbarians. It's delinked from that specific power formation uh, and recognizes both the interdependence of human and non-humans, but also the specific and respective degrees of intelligence and capability, the different faculties that each organism is endowed with. Uh, we humans cannot defeat gravity like some species of insect can. We have neither sonar nor radar like other animal species do, but we have other characteristics, in the incredible complexity of our hands, the complexity of our vision, the size and scale of our brains, specificity, differences. Differences need not be dialectical or hierarchical. They can just be differences. And, uh, we can differ in processes of mutual specification without a dialectic of violence, of extermination, of domination. I think a relational and collaborative ethics of affirmation, Spinoza would call it the ethics of joy, sustains this notion of a subjectivity that depends on non-humans and support non-humans, but remains anthropomorphic in its quality, in its capacities, and also in its limitations. So the accountability here is both epistemological and ethical, accounting for a specificity of the human in terms of intelligence, but also giving an ethical accountability of what it means to rely on others, uh, to, 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 to be cared for and care for others, to be affected by and affect others. Um, so for me, accountability is about uh, making sense of the specific locations that each entity inhabits. Um, and these locations are embedded in bodied, relational, and affective. The locations are geopolitical, um, uh, being Eurocentric or, um, or being located elsewhere. They are ecological. They are cultural, linguistic, historical. A location is a relationship to time as well as a relationship to space. It has a genealogical dimension as well as a geological one. I always say critical subjects such as yourselves, people who are forever investigating, probing, questioning, are people that are endowed with a counter memory, a memory of what could have been, will have been, the memory of the missing people, who those who did not make it, a memory that simply forgot to forget injustice, discrimination, marginalization. And I think that specific type of consciousness, a critical consciousness of who is not there, of who is missing, I think is terribly important to the pedagogical project of posthuman critical thought, because it makes you accountable for those who did not have the same privileges, the same entitlements. Um, it has a, a care, a dimension of care, for what I call the missing people. I have connected this care for the missing people 
to feminist, indigenous, race theories and epistemological systems, and I have brought them firmly into posthuman critical theory. This is where my critical posthumanism is of a specific brand. I bring in the entire tradition of critical theory, and I call to accountability the other schools of posthuman thought that have conveniently left behind the entire archive of critical theory, of feminism, of race, of indigeneity, sailing into a newly neutral vision of the posthuman, uh, it borrowed completely from the Enlightenment universalist idea of man. I think this is the sleight of hands that I'm really critical of. We cannot have a posthuman moment that eliminates all the capital of critical theory that has been developed since the Second World War across the world. That capital of knowledge needs to be brought to bear in the brave new world um, of posthumanism. And, and we need to talk about the power relations that we are bringing into the system and how we are going to set them up in the posthuman convergence. So we need uh, the new materialist philosophy to produce new knowledge, but also new forms of ethical accountability, keeping in mind always the need to balance the environmental and the digital, the technological and the ecological, while we ask the question of what kind of posthuman subjects are we capable of becoming. Crucial to this entire operation is to be rid of dualistic thinking or binary oppositions. Um, uh, and, and I think thinking in processes and not in dualistic opposites is the great challenge. And, and one of my quarrels with a lot of contemporary digital culture is, of course, it's binarism. It's, it's a very simple black and white kind of dualism. The crucial thing about thinking accountability epistemically and ethically in a posthuman uh, context is you have to think the flowing processes, the intersectionality, uh, the transversality of the events that you are uh, looking at. And I think going beyond dualism here, again, is something that we need to learn from feminism, from indigenous philosophies, from non-Western system, from race theory, where the dialectics of self and other gets dismantled. Um, so the crucial thing here is to also position the technological artifact, whatever te technological apparatus that we have, as an intimate other uh, to get rid of the nature culture distinction. Uh, the screen, uh, the internet is our second nature. Um, we, we, it's part of who we are and what we are. We really are natural, cultural, uh, zoe, geo, techno, mediated subjects, and we are doing very well with that. So let's assume that we already live, teach, uh, work in ways that we do not adequately represent to ourselves. And reaching an adequate representation of what we have already become is one of the challenges of posthuman pedagogy. We are already different types of subjects. How do we represent that in our practice, in our, in our research work, in our teaching work? Reality is always ahead of theory, and for sure. Um, so the posthuman subject emerges from this, and there's another building block uh, or key concept I'm giving you through an affirmative ethics of active involvement in experimenting with what we're capable of becoming. Affirmation is not silly optimism. That's advanced capitalism. That's, that's consumerism. That's Gwyneth Paltrow and uh, be happy, be happy, be young. Um, uh, th that shallow optimism, which is very cruel, as Lauren Berlan put it. Affirmation is the hard labor of constructing um, active, empowering, um, collaborative project and relations out of a context that is not always very productive. In fact, a context that very often um, leads us to despair and to exhaustion. Um, I think behind this is Spinoza's notion that everything that lives, I've already said it before, longs for the continuation of their existence. And uh, every living entity wants to go on living. There is kind of this, this, this vitality 
in living matter that is unstoppable, inexhaustible. Um, and uh, Spinoza calls it the pursuit of freedom, the freedom to become all that we can become, not in a neoliberal, uh, individualistic, consumeristic, self-empowerment way. No, it's always collective. We can only become in relation to others. We can only have a free planet with fresh air and fresh water together. You don't self-appoint yourself. Um, uh, the, 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 the end <clears throat> of all relations and projects. Um, it's collaborative, it's heterogeneous, it's aiming and making alliances with other forces, with other entities that share the same passion for active involvement in collective constructions of horizons of hope, of activism, putting the active back into activism. Um, so I think there is a collaborative morality in this type of ethical accountability that takes the different facets of the heterogeneous posthuman subjects and links them to a multitude of others. We are in debt to the earth. We are in debt to the atmosphere. We are in debt to electricity and technological cables. We are in debt to a multitude of human others. We are in debt to previous generation. We are in debt to future generation. We are part of a mass. Each entity is a multitude, is a collectivity, a multiplicity. So to, to activate the incredible capacity to generate productive connections out of such a rich heterogeneity makes posthuman subjectivity a, a kind of a joyful ride into possibility of co-constructions, of options, of alternatives, of other visions in a world that seems to be exhausted and deprived of visions. And the vision that I mostly favor in my critical posthumanism, of course, is the critique of uh, capitalism, the critique of exploitation of the resources of the earth and of other humans. Um, I, I really preach a, a not-for-profit, gratuitous um, philosophy of care uh, affirmation, accountability for human and non-humans. Um, and to be very critical and very democratic in the way we discuss the huge potential of the, of the technologies that we have ourselves um, uh, invented. I, I, I also want to put very much on, on the agenda the, the evaluation of the costs that we pay to be part of this system. And I'm really paraphrasing Virginia Woolf in the Three Guineas when she says we need to think, 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 think about the price that we are prepared to pay to be part of this system, a system that discriminates, that exploits, that goes wrong so often. Think we must. And I think this idea of thinking critically about the condition of our posthuman historical condition really brings the work of critique into a collaborative mode, but also into a creative mode. And this is my next key concept, critique as creation. The task of thinking, such as I've been defining it throughout, is obviously um, far more um, uh, thinking outside the box than anything neoliberal uh, economic free thinking uh, would uh, envisage. Um, it is about collective creative uh, construction of what I call cartographies of power. And a cartography is a roadmap, a little bit what I'm doing in miniature in this talk, giving you itineraries and pathways across the complexity of the present. The posthuman convergence needs to be mapped out. We need to agree on the terms of the cartography. For instance, in my cartography, never disengaging the technological from the ecological. And the cri cryptocurrencies may be great, but ecologically, they destroy the resources of these planets. So should we have them at all? Um, these are the discussion that we need to have, keeping the complexity of the situation in mind. Critical of power defined as potestas. From Foucault, I learned that power as a negative head, potestas, which uh, contains you, disciplines you, punishes you, prevents you from doing things. But power also has a very empowering, positive head, 
potentia, which allows you to express your inner freedom, the ontological force of self-perpetuation, which is the defining feature of everything that lives in a Spinozist, new materialist, philosophical frameworks. The creative side makes critique less sterile, less scoring point to prove how clever you are type of critique. Critique needs to be put to the task of offering alternatives. And the creative side of the critique enlists the resources of the imagination, of art, creativity, literature, uh, all of the musical field, um, as ways of experimenting with modes of relation with the multiple non-human that constitute subjectivity in a posthuman framework so that we can learn to think differently about ourselves and about our interactions with others and with the world as a whole. Constructing alternatives to the dominant humanistic and anthropocentric vision of the subject. So cartographies produce figurations, counter-representations, which I also describe as navigational tools. Deleuze would call them conceptual personae, um, ways of representing uh, what we are becoming that connect us and at the same time are rigorous enough to be accountable scientifically. One of the terms that I use to define this methodology is transversality. And transversality is the ability to cut across entities and concepts introduced in, um, by psychoanalytic theory, actually, to describe the power of desire. Desire defined as an ontological quality. A desire as an ontological quality for Spinoza is conatus, the drive to go on becoming, to persevere in your existence and continue to become the best possible version of yourself that you could become. Uh, and I think that the transversality is a force that is capable of subverting all the partitions, the divisions, and the boundaries. So it is a decentering force, a non-dialectical, non-dualistic force that allows us to explore while not becoming completely anarchical. It's been adopted in pedagogy by David Cole and many, uh, many of you, and it's a very well-known term, but I wanted to draw your attention to it, to be transversal, to cut across, to dare transdisciplinarity, transcorporeality, transindividuality. You will find a lot of trans language uh, in critical posthuman theory, and I always say the only interesting things are the transversal one. Um, everything that matters is in the trans mode. Uh, very, very important as a response to non dualistic ways uh, of thinking. And this has implication also, of course, for the institutional structure that we would give to our programs and to our curricula. So then what does it mean to think this way? And I'm going towards the conclusion. This new materialist, heterogeneous, posthuman, nomadic thought, it does come from my nomadism phase, um, argues that thinking as ontological relationality, critical thinking as speaking truth to power at a time of transition is more necessary than ever. We need to teach critical thinking. We need to inspire in people the desire for a radical democracy at a time when so much is in flux and people are so exhausted by various political experiments, at a time where the flirt with authoritarian, illiberal systems is so evident and so strong. Um, Spinoza was a theorist of radical democracy, rethinking our freedom in a context where everything is changing and the forces of capital are narrowing down the possibilities of what we can do, of how and what we can research and teach. So the, the creation of new concepts is what thinking is all about. And a concept is a figuration, a navigational tool, something that helps us navigate the stormy waters of the present. And this creation of your concept is always collaborative and collective. Methodologically, this means that we have to take the risk of transversality and not be nostalgic for linearity, for objectivity, for universalism, the mantra of the enlightenment mode of doing research and thinking in the humanities and social sciences. I think this is a time of non 
linear ways of thinking, of heterogeneity, of rhizomic relationality, web-like but not linear. It is the time to move beyond uh, Eurocentric way of thinking. Uh, Post-human critical theory has to be decolonial, has to look at the long shadow of European domination of the world as an element in our own understanding of what we call reason or what we call thinking, and uh, opening up to different systems. Um, and my um, interest at the moment is, uh, and, uh, and I learned so much from indigenous um, uh, particularly Australian Aboriginal worldview, uh, which are so crucial, particularly for environmental uh, stewardship um, of the earth. Um, so methodologically then look at how do we do this and put a lot of emphasis in the how part of your practice. I often say that posthuman critical thought is meta-methodological. It's, it's about commenting on how we do what we do, why we do it, while staying very close to it. Um, and, and teaching uh, means teaching real humanoids in this particular point on planet Earth. It is not an abstract speculation of what we may be capable of becoming. Again, I'm looking critically towards the transhumanist delusion um, of grandeur. <clears throat> Cartography, figuration, meta-methodological guidelines, problem-oriented approach, practical, caring, um, not in a linear manner, very transdisciplinary, very open, but accountable, being aware of what a difficult moment this is, that a great transition from the old human, such as we've practiced through centuries of European Western project of modernity, to the new human that is being constructed right now is fraught with all sorts of challenges, but also opportunities. As an ethics of affirmation thinker, I remain profoundly uh, optimistic and, and, and positive about the potential for the future. But posthuman critical theory is asking us to look very carefully at the new power constructions, to look around and say, who is missing from this project? Who is not here? Who have we left uh, behind? Who are we that are becoming posthuman? And every time I say we, I put it in inverted commas, we are in this predicament together, but we are not all one and the same. Um, we differ. And taking these differences into account, making cartographic renditions of them, reworking them into the system, is a way of transposing social justice, solidarity, democracy into the posthuman era in a manner that honors the best of the humanistic tradition. And the best of the humanistic tradition is the emancipation project that humanism carried. And uh, the hope for a better future for all humans. We need to hold on to that, even as we know that the we is fragmented, internally fractured, but don't let those differences and fractures be become f fragments of antagonism and hatred. Make them building block of a possible, collaborative, heterogeneous future. Um, a gesture of collective self-styling, of democratic critical assessment of what we're capable of doing. Doing. We are a community that is not only bound together uh, negatively by shared vulnerability. We're a community that is held together by a collaborative, productive ethics of becoming. And I think uh, posthuman critical thinkers in pedagogy as elsewhere are bonded by the compassionate acknowledgement of our interdependence to multiple human and non-human others. Yes, we are in this together, but we are not one and the same. Let's honor the heterogeneity while also moving forth towards a collaborative ethics of affirmation. These are my building blocks. This is what I wanted to say. Uh, look forward to the Q&A question. I imagine there will be many, and I wish you all the best for the rest of the proceeding. We have heard a great lecture by Rosie Braidotti. So she will join us over the Zoom right now and uh, Kay will moderate this discussion. So please just raise a hand for uh, questions. Thank you. So, hello Rosie, can you hear us? Don't 
don't know if she can hear. Can you hear us, Rosie? Oh, good. We, we can't hear you, so we're just waiting oh. to sort that out. We've got you now. Can you hear me now? We can, yes. Thank you. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi, Rosie. So this is Kay. Um, I recognise you. Hello, Kay, yeah, my friend. Hi. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Great to be here, Rosie. Thank you so much for joining us. So we've just listened to your wonderful lecture, uh, just digesting it and thinking about some of the ideas. And I'm going to invite some questions and go straight for some questions uh, from the Perfect. Floor, that's okay. So I think we've got a roving microphone, have we? I'm just going to ask people um, if you can just keep your questions to the points, if that's okay. So not too lengthy, um, make it very clear what your question is about. And if you could just say your name um, as well at the start, that would be great. So yes, please raise your hand if you have a question for Rosie. I'm, I'm happy to start and kick off. I found... Just wait for the microphone, yeah. I'm not sure if, um, is it on? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And I don't know if anybody can see me. This is the post-humanist <laughs> moment. But um, I, um, I, was, I found your lecture very stimulating, and specifically because of this um, attempt to look at a post-humanist subjectivity, what that would be, um, because as you point out, just talking about networks and relations is not satisfying to somebody who wants to see the world change and change for the better. But um, I'm, I kind of come from a perspective of narrative theory, even in teaching. And my question for you is, um, what kind of stories um, do, does the post-human, this, um, I, I wrote it down, um, now I can't remember, Zoe Gino Techno-Human tell? Um, how, how do we create um, affirmative and compelling stories without the unit human anymore? Um, is it enough to say that this is a relational um, a, a, a politics of ethics, uh, of care, of affirmation? How does, what would be a narrative example, for example, of a story that a Zoe genotechno human would tell? Do I answer immediately, Chair? Or yes? yes, yes, please. We go it. one on one. So don't let me go on too much. You know that I tend to talk too much. A wonderful question. Um, and I um, did uh, emphasize in the talk the importance of narratives, of figurations, of the imagination, of um, counter representations, because I think that that is absolutely uh, crucial. The, if anything, and the posthuman in its mainstream uh, version suffers from a sort of over representation. And, and the genre that has um, carried this uh, probably since the Cold War is science fiction. And if, even if you look at the, at, the, at the nuclear bomb Cold War movies, the main characters is hardly ever just the human, uh, tarantula, um, the 54-foot woman, the shrinking man, um, the King Kong. I mean, we're, we're looking at a proliferation on non-humans, very much part of the imaginary of modernity. Um, so the first genre would be the speculative fiction that comes from all of the industrial, post industrial and the science fiction, which has many ramifications into the radical cultures. Um, strong tradition of feminist science fiction, um, really going way back to Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's uh, kind of favorite uh, monstrosity. Uh, hetero talk about heterogeneous assemblages, you can't beat that one. Um, strong tradition of lesbian, gay, utopian visions of, of uh, post-human futures. That is probably at the moment one of the strongest schools um, uh, booming on also in musical culture. I am thinking of singers like Bjorg, who are very, very speculative, uh, always into uh, non-human partners, um, whether it be an organic or an inorganic one. I talked about Afrofuturism and um, Octavia Butler and all the um, visions of liberation coming from the margins. And then robotics, the, the, the literature of robots. And for us people of this um, you know, media culture, it also means computer games, video games, 
It means television series, where it's not a question of doing without the human. It's never without the human. It is a human enhanced by a multiplicity of non-humans. Uh, it is, it is uh, human and robots, human and animals, human and superhuman. Uh, it is, it is, it is. So the fact that the social imaginary has already overrepresented posthuman futures makes the task of narrative particularly difficult. Because how can you beat the disaster movies that Hollywood is pouring out for us about the end of the world? That is a genre that is so successful. And it is about the death of man. It's about the extinction of the human. So it would be a question of engaging with this mainstream genres and trying to put in counter narratives, counter figurations, um, with, which may be on a smaller scale, or may, may be more humble in some ways, but would be running on an ethics of affirmation and, and a regeneration and care in the spectacle of our own destruction, which is what so much of the dominant narratives in the Anthropocene have become. Thanks, Rosie. But just a little bit, the connection's a little bit unstable, but we caught that, the end of that, I think. Oh, do you, do, do you need me to repeat anything? No, no, we're, we're okay. I think we, we caught up. So yeah, I think we would, that idea that stories are important, aren't they? So stories, but new narratives, I think, yeah. Thank but you. also that they've been saturated in the dominant culture so that to undo them or put in alternative representation, we have to work quite hard um, and maybe work on a smaller scale and certainly work on affirmative values, regeneration, care, and uh, not this, you know, absolute joy in watching the end of the world. Um. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we have work to do. Okay, let's take um, another question then, please. I've um, got someone just here. Hi, Rosie. Thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. Passionate lecture, I must say. Um, uh, this is a follow-up question, actually, to your previous answer. Uh, because our, uh, after, your, after this discussion, we will have a panel uh, on the topic of trans and post-humanism in arts. Uh, so the question is, can we take uh, our new media artistic practices like virtual art, bio art, genetic art, AI art as counter narratives to the popular culture, the dominant popular cu culture narratives? And what is your take on arts in, in uh, the role of arts in educating or like making us think uh, on this topic of uh, critical posthumanism? Thank you. Great question. Thank you so much. Uh, dear to my heart, uh, I, I turn to the arts, to media practices, to, to popular culture quite regularly in my work. And, and I have stated quite clearly that I do think that artistic practice uh, enjoys more freedom and more creativity than, than theoretical practices do. Um, there's a lot of more freedom and more uh, transdisciplinarity. The example that I have of this to, to prove how generative and how productive art practices is, is none other than the current Venice Biennale, uh, for which I was an advisor and to which I contributed essays for the catalog. And the head curator, Cecilia Alemani, ran the entire Biennale this year on posthumanist lines. And I really recommend that you make the trip if you can, or at least go online. It's 86% of women and the themes are the intersection of the digital and the environmental um, with a very massive presence of black women and indigenous um, women. There's a fantastic indigenous pavilion of the Nordic countries uh, making the point that artistic practice makes loud and clear theoretical and political statements. There's also a Ukrainian pavilion, by the way, uh, and there is no Russian pavilion. Um, so this is an example of a, of a very strong statement that was made after many years of a couple of years of COVID silence. Um, and I'm deeply moved and also very honored to have been part of this progress, of uh, this project. So that's a, a, as good an example as can get on a smaller scale. Um, I work with several artists that explore the different facets of the posthuman convergence, a lot of uh, bio art a lot of eco art, 
and a tremendous amount of algorithmic art um, that is so advanced now. Um, uh, I haven't looked at the, car at the, at the current documenta uh, in Castle, but um, apparently um, it's a place to go to also to answer your question. So I would say a privileged, very avant-garde, not in any elitist sense of the term, but in the daring, experimental sense. Uh, and I think theory lagging behind this is not a great era for theory. I think it's a period for practice and for hands-on. Um, and I think uh, the research done through artistic practice absolutely vital, I would say. Thanks, Rosie. Was Brilliant. that clear te technologically? <laughs> It's a recurrent theme, isn't it? I was thinking about the, the various summer schools that we've, we've had every year in Utrecht and the, the absolute interweaving of, of art throughout all of those and how yes. pivotal I think it's been in terms of reimaginings and rethinkings. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> okay, let's take um, another one, please. We've got a gentleman at the back. Hi, thank you for your <laughs> talk. Uh, this is Antonio here. I have a question about your notion of accountability and depth and how that would relate to education because it was a point that uh, you brought up recurrently in, in, the, in the talk, right? how we have to be accountable and how we have to recognize that we are in debt to many human and non-human uh, entities, to our elders, to plants, to animals, and so on. Um, but I was wondering if you could clarify a little bit this idea of debt, because it also sounds very late capitalistic, neoliberal subjectivity of, of indebted humans, always in debt with something, right? And, and then how, how to prevent that if education is about recognizing this debt or accountability, how can we prevent that it becomes tokenistic? Then so it's just like okay we're in debt to black people so we have to say something about black people we're in debt to uh, this so uh, so it becomes like a list of 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 yes of being accountable to something so it just to talk about accountability and debt yes yes excellent question complicated um, obviously we operate within the conditions of uh, advanced capitalism neoliberalism operating within does not mean that we. Uh, completely coincide with them or support them, but it is the material that we need uh, to be working with. I am a critical Spinozist um, and not a Hegelian Marxist. Uh, I believe in the politics of imminence, that is to say in the politics of location, that we speak from somewhere very specific, that we are positioned by our bodies, by our geopolitical locations, by our culture and languages and and all the attributes of subjectivity. And I'm a student of Foucault, so location, immanence, power, also a student of uh, Deleuze, and of course, feminism and the critical theories that go with it. So you cannot be accountable for everything at all places, at all times. You speak from somewhere. You don't do the God trick. You don't do the universal. I'm accountable for all, every single branch of whatever, um, you're accountable for a number of issues that are related to your embodied, embedded practices. And I think that that micro scale um, and qualitative shift, which is what I read in Deleuze and Guattari and in their critique of um, the Hegelian Marxist paradigm, allows you to uh, be accountable for concrete practices um, that you're engaged with. Education is caught within the profit motive, uh, the vision of the, the subject that, that we operate with in neoliberal economics is the micromanager of one's own uh, attributes and qualities. And, uh, it is all under the signifier of the capitalization and, and profit making. Challenging that while being accountable, that is to say responsible for the well-being of the students and helping them survive in the very difficult economic situations into which they will have to fight for their um, life and their livelihood, is the balancing act that we do in education. Um, depends on which level, of course, you pitch it. Um, uh, but I think from primary to tertiary education, we are dealing with a job of care for our students 
preparing them for very, very harsh conditions out there. So it's accountability to our immediately community, accountability for values that we experience through our locations, accountability to a vision that has to be empowering in the collective um, affirmative sense of the term, uh, the becomings minoritarians of the Lesa Guattari, if you know that, those philosophies, or the joyful acts um, of radical Spinozism, whether you do it with Tony Negri, with Balibar, with, with any of those, the French philosophers that are trying to push the political at both a micro level and a, in a transversal level of interconnections to human and non-human. But no, it is not the mantra of uh, politically correct identity politics, the specific modes of accountability uh, framed by the locations that you can name and visualize and share uh, collectively in terms of being embodied, embedded, relational and effective. That's a bit the methodology that I have in mind. That's really wonderful. Thank you um, for that explanation, Rosie. Okay, another question, please. Yep, Mike, go for it. Uh, hi, uh, I'm really um, inspired by your uh, lecture and um, believe that the new paradigm, this approach will, will help us. Um, but my question is very simple. Do we have time to develop the paradigm? So, uh, thank you, and I noticed the tinge of anxiety in your question. Uh, Kay knows this, but my immediate reaction would be, who is we? And where are we located? And where are we positioned? It is of the greatest importance. Um, uh, for some areas of the world, geopolitical uh, positioning, in terms of climate change, it is already too late. Um, for other parts, I'm thinking of you know, Pacific Islanders, um, I'm thinking of the permafrost uh, uh, thawing in, um, up in the Arctic Circle, I'm thinking of areas where it is quite clear that climate change is, is irreversible and it has already uh, really started. Um, other parts of the world, indigenous epistemologies, decolonial theory, tell us that for them, it was already urgent in 1492, and that the, the end of the world has already happened to colonize populations over and over again. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's, it's yes, it's too late, but the resilience and the resistance and the capacity for regeneration are extraordinary. Uh, we're on uh, here in the Euro European soil, and Serbia, but Netherlands wouldn't make any difference. We are on the eve, maybe, of um, the nuclear conflagration. Do we have the time? Um, I think you have to do as if, and you have to, um, my advice would be um, to cultivate the, um, maybe it's a fiction, to go back to the question about speculative narratives. Um, do as if we actually can, um, construct better futures, um, uh, do not give in to what I consider as the dominant rhetoric of complaint, which is how the Western world has confronted climate change. But I would say that's how the left is confronting the rise of neo-fascism with a mixture of, oh, I told you so, and oh, is this not awful? Uh, I'm thinking of Walter Benjamin's uh, article on the melancholia of the left. Um, uh, maybe that's that's what we do on the left. We 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 sort of lament um, and and we fear the worst. But I think the notion of the present as something that is not just the saturated here and now of a closed horizon, but the idea that the present, the present time, is both the record of what we are ceasing to be and the seeds of what we are in the process of becoming. And here I'm thinking of Deleuze's work on Bergson and a time continuum where the present is both actual, what we are ceasing to be, and virtual, what we're capable of becoming. We have to um, almost like, like a praxis, like a political practice, and um, focus on the possibilities of becoming. Uh, and construct together potentials um, for getting on. We need to resist this 
the sadness of the soul, because the sadness of the soul is one of the definitions of microfascism in neo spinozist philosophy. It's when the horizon shuts down, where all your energies are sapped, where there is no point doing um, anything, uh, the sense of impossibility or powerlessness. That's when we really uh, we lose if we give in to that. Affirmative ethics is the humble, patient uh, task of swallowing your tears and working towards sustainable horizons of possibility because the present is also the seeds of what we're capable of becoming. So yes, there is time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that. I love that notion of um, acting as if. I think that's so, so incredibly helpful, actually. Fantastic. So another question, please. <coughs> uh, hello, Rosie. Uh, wonderful to listen to you as always. Uh, my name is Marian. Hello, Marian. I don't see you. Hello. Sorry, I can't be there, my friend. I'm, I'm sitting here. Well, uh, thanks for a fantastic lecture, indeed. And of course, it raises so many questions, but I'll just try to pose one quickly. Um, when you were talking about you know, these binary uh, oppositions and dualisms that are uh, constitutive of capitalism, like the subject-object distinction, like universal versus particular, uh, objectivity versus subjectivity, uh, and all of that. Um, uh, and when you counterpose that to the Spinozist ontology that you yourself uh, argue for, I was wondering, uh, I remembered uh, a place in Adorno's work where he says something like, uh, these oppositions, like subjectivity, objectivity, they are not simply ideological. They are not simply false, in the sense that they can be that they, they are used to justify uh, uh, exploitation and so forth. These distinctions they structure social reality in capitalism. They are practically operative, and this is one of the central uh, theses of classical critical World War II critical theory that these abstractions are not simply cognitive; they are practical. They are as they would say, they are real abstractions. Mm -hmm. They take mm -hmm. place in, in exchange relations in capitalism and so on. So would you say that it is enough to simply wage a symbolic struggle against these distinctions uh, uh, in a sense that we articulate a discursive critique of them and then we try to basically build a counter hegemonic block or something? Or do we need to practically subvert these, these oppositions uh, uh, in some way uh, to make room for, for new modes of uh, relating to the world. Like, for example, non -par not participating in the capitalist monetary economy, which gives rise to these practical abstractions, which are then transposed into conceptual schemes that, that structure our relations to the world. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friend, you can see what the conversation with Marian has are like. We're always like this, and then we take six weeks uh, to deal with a question. Amazing, um, uh, difficult, complicated. Um, there will always be in our conversation, Marian, your, your profound Hegelianism and my equally profound Spinozism uh, get sort, of sort of coming to terms with the complexities and the points of intersection uh, between uh, our approaches. So very um, uh, quickly, it's a very complicated question, but clearly the binary oppositions, the dualism are operative, they are practical, um, they make the world go round, and we have been thinking in those terms, certainly since uh, modernity, um, since the Cartesian paradigm became the consensus of, of European modernity. Um, and may I remind you that, uh, us all that th there were many other alternative ontologies that our culture could have taken. Spinoza had already produced a monistic ontology that argued that, that we are all nature culture, we're all part of the same nature culture continuum. I'm using contemporary language. Uh, in, as Spinoza would say, we're all part of nature. We're all part of the same meta. And we're all differential variation within the same meta. So that alternative was there. But our culture embraced Cartesian dualism because that is a much better instrument of governance. Um, it allows you to divide and conquer. It's much more applicable to market economy and certainly very useful to the project of European colonialism because an us and them ontology really justifies white man's burden to bring the light of reason to the barbaric masses out there 
And there isn't a single philosopher of modernity, including your beloved Hegel, that does not justify colonialism. I close that bracket. Now, so the, the binaries are there, the dualisms are there, they're operative, they're practical. The question is, how do we get rid of them? How do we overcome them? Um, and I think uh, um, for me, having picked um, at some particular point in my itinerary, the Spinozist uh, road means that I do not believe that there is an outside of the capitalist economy that we can step into. Um, um, and here the discussion is, as you know, the function of the negative. Um, uh, you can't step outside just because you're against. Uh, you can be against and still be fully immersed in the conditions that determine your state of subjugation, um, your state of misery, your state of enslavement. Um, um, so the, the idea is, the notion is, starting from the politics of imminence, recognize that the dualistic or the binaries are practical ways. And I think Deleuze would say they have an analytic function. Um, uh, nomad, um, uh, and, uh, sedentary, nomadic, uh, um, majoritarian, minoritarian, um, you know, male, female. These are ways of organizing, but they are not ontologically substantive. Uh, it, 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 there's no fundamental dialectical logic that supports them. So um, the, the, what there is, is a common matter within which we differentiate um, through processes, variations of mutual specification. The neo-materialism of the new Spinozis, whether it's the feminists, the Deleuzians, um, the indigenous population that, that, that talk about uh, perspectivism are differential. Um, and this is where the object ontologies get it all wrong. There is no flat ontology. It's differential. Uh, matters differ, organisms differ, but we differ not in a di dualistic binary oppositions, in modulations of constant differing. So it is more a matter of making this dualism more harmless, multiply them in a heterogeneous way, hoping to uh, create within the conditions of our subjugation spaces where we escape the territorial flows, the speeds of a system that simply wants to make a buck, simply wants profit and short term, mindless, chronically destructive um, profit motive. Capitalism is a system that has attached itself to any number of state formations. It is not something that is typical of liberal democracies. And it is just as strong uh, in Russia, just as strong in China, which you experience in Serbia on a daily basis, obviously. So the idea that capitalism equals Western democracies, that's completely not the case. Capitalism is a program that has attached itself to multiple state formations. Uh, some of them hierarchical, others not. So I think having a more differential um, cartography of what we are looking at and how the new dualisms and new binary oppositions um, work would be useful. One last point. I think what char is characteristic of advanced liberal democracies is that capitalism has really become post-binary. And I think Deleuze and Guattari were brilliant to see this back in 1972. Uh, capitalism doesn't need sexual difference. It doesn't need dualisms. It's rhizomic. It's scattered. Um, it's polymorphic. The more, the better. Uh, you know, a thousand little sexes so that we can send, sell you a thousand little gadgets and, and, and entertainments and, and haircuts and, and TV series. And so the fact that Western capitalism is post-binary creates another set of problems. Um, that we have to deal with in feminism and LGBTQ areas. This is not the case, obviously, for um, uh, Russian uh, capitalism that is profoundly binary and reactionary, um, or the Chinese one that is profoundly hierarchical. So I would have a topology, a cartography, based on how the binaries are being structured within variations on the capitalist um, uh, program, shall we say. It's a really difficult question, Marion. So if you want to write a reply and if... K allows it, and I'm very happy to continue. No, 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 thanks, thanks a lot. This was very clarifying, thank you. I can imagine you both having some fantastic discussions um, through all of that, but brilliant. Thank you for the question and, and that great explanation. So I think we've probably got time for one, possibly two 
more questions. Um, so yes, if anyone else would like to ask anything. Okay, first of all, thank you for helping us start this conference with really crucial questions of ethics, of responsibility, accountability. Uh, I would have a question a bit more on a practical side, I hope. Uh, when we talk about uh, creating new navigational tools, new concepts, new narratives, new possibilities, and it's always collaborative and uh, creative effort of joint endeavor, um, sometimes when we work with other people, now I focus only on people, uh, especially when you work with people who are not just scientists, but from practice or students or children maybe, um, it becomes kind of difficult in practice to find balance between not being too elitistic in some things, so that it's so uh, something so new, so provoking that it kind of uh, people push aside. And uh, on the other side, the danger of not banalizing things. So I would like to hear if you have some sort of comment on that, or maybe advice how not to elitize these things and not banalize it in the same time while, while we're working in practice. So neither sort of too elitist nor too, too banal, how to strike that balance. Um, um, I think in terms of pedagogy, this is a, a crucial question and one that needs to be grounded uh, very carefully in a specific practice. And, uh, I, I think what I notice now that I'm working not only at the university, but I started working in, a, in an institute of design and urban planning uh, because I wanted to see how climate change is discussed outside academia. So I'm working with designers, architects and architects in the city of Rotterdam, and we're looking at how they are designing uh, a green future. Uh, I do notice uh, how right Foucault was when he said that there is knowledge everywhere. The extent to which knowledge pr production is a real widespread um, uh, net of, of practices and know-hows now with the internet even more than in the days when Foucault was talking about the access of discourse in relation to how much of that discourse is accepted as science and the selection and the filtering mechanism whereby knowledge production systems by activists, by normal citizens, by kids, by songwriters, by, by art, by filmmakers, um, all of that knowledge production gets filtered and selected. Uh, and then some of it becomes historically true and gets the seal of proper science. Well, with the coming of internet, all of those filters have pretty much gone. Uh, we, are, we are sort of swimming in fake news and alternative truths, which is a, a nightmare of its own. But the advantage of this messy situation is that you see the extent to which so much knowledge is circulating. Just think of the digital revolution and what kids of 15 know that we 60 plus can just only dream of. Um, recently, Goldman Sachs opened a special uh, br branch for um, millionaires under the age of 30 who are mostly app developers um, and digital whiz kids, um, some of them really, really young, um, who have simply understood what the new economy looks like. So it is not as kind of extreme as I remember it to be, this, this balancing act between over kind of competence, under competence. And it, it, I find it quite humbling to see how much um, uh, is known and shared, and in some respect, how behind the official institutions of knowledge are. Certainly, research universities as a model seems to me uh, having great difficulties keeping up. I think that the research university model is not the one that we need, quite frankly, to cope with this explosion of knowledge outside the places where it historically it was produced. This is also known as as cognitive capitalism and all the questions that we've discussed today are perfectly pertinent. Does it mean then that neoliberal economics um, and, you know, calls the shot? And you do know that in education, there are many political forces that would love to shut down the universities and the high schools and the polytechnics and have private educations done by mentors and coaches uh, lifelong, you pay for it. Um, uh, we don't need, you know, free universal education. So I really don't want to go there. But I, I do think that taking in some of the enormous wisdom and knowledge that is circulating um, would help us all uh, to move forth to a new, I think we need a new alliance between the academic archive and the new knowledge practices prompted 
but the post-human convergence, the technologies, the climate crisis. Um, uh, and I think our role is maybe to do knowledge transfer um, from one sector to the other and open multiple dialogues. But to do that, we need to be a little bit humble and open and, 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 and relational um, and curious. And, and I'm not sure that those are qualities that neoliberal education particularly values. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. I'm just gonna take Chair's privilege and just ask a little question quickly on, on the back of that, if that's okay with everybody. Um, and it's in relation to schooling, Rosie, and I was thinking about your points um, on the importance of teaching critical thinking of transversal practices um, and rhizomatic nature of learning and all of those kind of things. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on schooling really is, is schooling as a concept or as practice you know almost in its sort of universality mm -hmm. is that still can that still be a model that we use for education do you think or is there something else that needs to shift it's a model that i cherish and i would love to re-embrace it's almost a medieval monastic model you know um schola scholarum it's really the the beginning of it all was was meeting around uh, a person who could read big thick books and discuss together the basics. Um, uh, and I think any type of critical theory I've been doing over the last 20 years, I, I had to be schooled. I certainly had to be schooled out of dualistic thinking, which was so in, 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 in simply inbuilt into our ways of thought. I think psychoanalysis helped with that, Deleuze helped with that. We had to be schooled out of um, whiteness, Eurocentrism, um, through decolonial race, indigenous, knowledge, you have to be very, very open to, to take um, the extent of, of the colonial arrogance that we carry in our models um, of thinking. And, and right now, maybe being schooled in a work of care for the world at a time when it is really is not in a value, not in the universities. It's all about quantification and professionalization and uh, micromanagement of your of your cap personal capital. It's, it's the opposite of the work of care. So I, I, I think very much, and I, I often say, I think I said it in my valedictory uh, lecture that uh, university professors are just teachers. You know, it is, I see no major difference between a primary school teacher and uh, and a professor, we are people of schooling, being schooled constantly. And in the number of tasks that we have to learn now include unlearning a number of privileges, unlearning a number of habits of thought that we had inherited from the past that at the moment not only do not help us, but are actually hindering our understanding of the conditions, the, 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 the emergencies, the urgencies or the problems that we are facing. There's something of a monastic humility in schooling that clashes with the rhetoric of neoliberal academic qualifications and competences. Um, so yes, absolutely, very dear to my heart. It's part of our alliance, um, Kay, that, that we are people of the school. We are, we are teachers um, in our hearts, I think, as well as in our minds. Um, and, and, and we see, certainly I see the university as a place where that, the teaching should be absolutely central. And that's why I think the model of the research universities is not correct. Big question there too. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I love the idea of unlearning. That, that feels so key. Defamiliarizing. And apologies for stealing a question. Rosie knows I always do this. Um, it's fantastic. But, but, you always do it very graciously. Do, yes. <laughs> we do have time for one more if someone else would like to ask. Um, Natasha, I think. I don't know. Hello, hi, Rosie. Natasha speaking. Um, Hello, I don't see you, but I can hear you. <laughs> yes, okay, great. Um, so uh, thank you, first of all, for your uh, keynote. It was very interesting and it raised a lot of um, critical and interesting questions. And um, I would build on uh, the previous two questions, uh, which are linked to education. So um, how long would it take to actually be more open to the post-humanist and new material uh, thinking, as well as practice, in the field of higher education across disciplines and also just generally programs in education studies, uh, because that's also where I'm positioned. And I think um, 
what do you think about it and, and what do you think about um, the ways to um, bridge the current approaches that I, I think they're still very much rooted in you know, the long-lived traditions of, I don't know, behaviorism, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it seems a little bit distant from the perspective of a lot of educational programs. So um, I really wonder about that. And, and it does not necessarily mean that we need to suddenly transform things and persuade people in anything because there will be different approaches to both post-human and new material. Um, I'm more wondering about how yeah. long, why there is this resistance, what we can do, and and yes, what what was your opinion on that? Because I think um, I think there is a distance between some sort of theoretical approach to it and thinking, and the practice of it that is going on globally and internationally, and I. <laughs> I'm just all the time wondering, so what do we do? Because there is a strong resistance to a lot of new thinking, to a lot of new practices, especially when we get to the basics, such as learning, teaching, and assessment in higher education, which is some of the things that um, yes. I lead on. Yes, that's a great question. Um, I actually, uh, I understand the resistance from the uh, more traditional humanities, but I really don't think that that's, uh, the key problem, if I may say so. Uh, let me give you a, a concrete example. We just finished with a, a network of European universities a uh, project for the whole, founded by the Volkswagen Foundations about the state of the humanities in Europe. It's a small scale, not, not you know, in any way comprehensive. Uh, but we focused on the back-to-back -back discourses, one about the crisis of the humanities, which translates into uh, budgetary cuts um, for humanities and social sciences, which are quite dramatic across the EU with peaks um, in countries like the UK, unfortunately, uh, but also Denmark, um, the north of Europe, essentially, the rich countries are simply defunding uh, the humanities. And next to it, back to back to it, the growth of new fields of the humanities, which we have called the post-humanities, uh, which are environmental humanities, digital humanities, medical humanities, neural humanities, public humanities, and the list continues. I analyzed this in the second volume of my posthuman trilogy, the volume called Posthuman Knowledge. Uh, and again, I didn't set, it didn't invent any of this. We simply come, came across them uh, when doing this mini survey of what is happening to us. Now, the extent to which these new humanities are being developed, where, by whom, with what money, is extremely interesting. Uh, China is basically only doing the digital, and but they do it really very, very well. Um, Germany is doing a lot of environmental humanities, um, and, uh, and almost everybody now since COVID does the medical humanities, which includes death studies, which is a very big growth area, um, that is quite stunning, actually, to, to, to watch the rise of death studies. Um, the, the actual analysis of this m multiplication of studies and then the emergence of the new humanities uh, would require more means, financial and human, than we have at hand. But my, uh, I keep tracking them, and my latest example is the University of Cork in Ireland, that has simply created a new humanities faculty next to the old humanities faculty. And the new humanities faculty, which calls itself the radical humanities, that's something for Marion, I think, to look into, uh, assumes as the building blocks, the environmental humanities, the medical humanities, the digital humanities, the public humanities. It does not assume as the building block, the disciplines. So my point here is that we have historically, a shift away from the classical humanities discipline towards transdisciplinarity, okay, and I talk a lot about transversality, um, the fact that that studies can emerge as, as, as an area. Look at how it is done in Bath and Bristol. Incredible programs, um, taking death across about 12 di departments and disciplines. Um, transversality, a cutting across, uh, means that the old humanities will have a really hard time surviving as anything more than 
a museum of national identity. And as Ulrich Beck taught us many, many years ago, methodological nationalism is what has always made the humanities stick, certainly in a place like Europe with all of our different languages and traditions and histories. And we do need that, that healthy nationalism. We need to know our histories and languages, but nationalism alone cannot possibly be the only motivation for keeping the humanities. So I see a proliferation of post-humanities. I see a defunding of the classical humanities and the people who resist within the classical humanities don't have much for future because the trend is quite clear uh, that advanced capitalism does not want, does not need the humanities and that they have made it abundantly clear. Look at Copenhagen, look at Vienna, look, look at the shutdowns and they're shutting down entire faculties. And uh, now this opens another conversation about the extent to which radical epistemologies, including critical posthumanism, can come to the rescue of the humanities, and which I do and on a daily basis, saying we do need literature, we do need philosophy, we can't do without them. How do you imagine that we redesign the human without knowing where we are coming from? But transhumanism, which is the ethos of advanced capitalism, Elon Musk, is redesigning the human anyway whether they know their art history uh, and their philosophy or not. And trust me, Elon Musk doesn't know much of either, but they're redesigning it anyway. Um, uh, and I think the, how to get hold of that, how to be recognized as an interlocutor in this historical uh, switch towards a transhumanist paradigm, I think that's the huge question. Um, and, and here I may rejoin one of the previous speakers and say we may not have a lot of time um, okay. to actually make make an impact, make an intervention on this open, almost a, a scramble for the new human and the new humanities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosie. That's wonderful. And I think it's given us a huge amount to think about. You know, as you say, we've got, got work to do. We've got lots of things to discuss um, to, to keep moving these things forward. So just to say thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you can't see us, but we're all smiling. And um, you missed the applause, so let's have another round of applause. Thank you. So sorry I can't be there. So yes, very much appreciated. And um, thank you for your time. And we'll, we'll see you very soon. Work well. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, bye Kate. Bye. Bye, Marion. Bye. 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 bye.